Hello, I'm Barry Mitchell and welcome to Simply Science. It's December and automobile experts say this is the best month to buy a car. And with the economy and fuel economy on consumers' minds, more and more people are looking at electric cars. But for those that don't know their hybrid from their plug-in, here's Andrew Falzone. The most basic type of electrified vehicle is the hybrid. Hybrid vehicles are powered by a very efficient gasoline engine and an electric motor. There's also a small battery system on board that recaptures energy that would otherwise be wasted. The energy is stored as electricity and powers the electric motor only when needed. Derek Joyce has worked in product development for a Hyundai USA. Also, it has regenerative braking. And so what happens is uh, heat energy that would typically be wasted uh, coming up to a stoplight or braking of any kind is, is uh, recuperated, is regenerated, and put back into the battery system. The next type of electrified vehicle is a plug-in hybrid, which still has a gas engine, but a much larger battery pack. Because unlike a regular hybrid, you can literally plug the vehicle into a standard or upgraded electrical outlet to recharge the battery when it depletes. The large battery also allows a plug-in hybrid to operate entirely on electricity for a limited range. Alex Dykes is an independent automotive expert and host of the highly regarded YouTube channel, Alex on Autos. The plug-in hybrids aren't gonna take you to that, that zero gasoline consumption level. Um, but in perhaps a more rational world, if you're looking at this holistically and you say, I just want to reduce my consumption, I want to be environmentally friendly, then either a hybrid or a plug-in hybrid could be a good option. But if you totally want to kick the fuel can and use zero gasoline, then you're looking for a battery electric vehicle, more commonly called an EV or a BEV. And while running on juice is cheaper than running on gas, running out of juice can be a major inconvenience. EV owners call it range anxiety. There's always this fear that, that you'll run out and, and that that the running out will take some enormous chunk of time out of your life, which is definitely true uh, if you run out in the wrong place. Now that we know about the three different types of electrified vehicles, we can talk about some of the new options that are out there. The RAV4 Prime is a small SUV and plug-in vehicle from Toyota. It has an EPA estimated 42 mile electric only range, which is the longest electric only range for any plug-in vehicle ever released in the US. So if you're driving to work, that means you can go 21 miles each way without having to recharge. While past plug-in hybrids had big batteries that took up valuable trunk space, the RAV4 Prime's big batteries are under the vehicle body and rear passenger seat. That means almost no intrusion on rear cargo space. And unlike past mid-priced hybrids and plug-ins that compromised on speed and performance, the RAV4 Prime has an impressive 302 combined horsepower, which means it can do zero to 60 in about 5.7 seconds. Alex has been behind the wheel. If you simply wanted a comfortable family hauler that gets excellent fuel economy, a really surprising amount of EV range, and will also go like the clappers when you want it to, that's exactly what the RAV4 Prime is. And for those who want to go all in on electricity, the Hyundai Kona EV is a practical option. While its unique front fascia and upfront charging port help it stand out, what truly sets it apart is its affordable price tag that can still go the distance. The Kona EV has a pretty long range. It's nearly 250 miles. It's going to be great for that person that wants a daily commuter, uh, wants a good all-around vehicle, and never really leaves their major metro area uh, outside of a flight. And both of these electrified vehicles are among the first to offer no compromise practicality at an affordable price. According to Kelly Blue Book, the average new car cost as of October 2020 in the U.S. was just under $38,000 and just over $31,000 in the small SUV crossover segment, which includes the RAV4 and the Kona. The introductory price for the Kona EV is just over $37,000 and the RAV4 Prime is just over $38,000, but both vehicles are eligible for a $7,500 federal tax credit. Of course, buyers should consult their accountants to confirm eligibility. 
So if you're looking to reduce your gas consumption and do it affordably, maybe one of these electrified vehicles is exactly what you're looking for. I'm Andrew Falzone for Simply Science. Nearly 3 billion people worldwide play video games. It's an industry worth $160 billion a year. And there's a new game with an unusual main character, a marine biologist. It's the height of adventure at the depths of the ocean. The ocean cast its spell on me that day, and its mystery still consumes me. It's here, an engrossing video game without violence or car chases. Kids are spending so much time in front of their computers playing video games. Why not use this as a vector to help them learn really cool things about the ocean? Baruch College Presidential Professor David Gruber is a world-renowned marine biologist, one of several oceanic explorers who advised on the creation of the video game Beyond Blue. A lot of different areas of my research are in there. We had worked with fluorescent sharks and designed a shark eye camera a few years ago. That made it into the game. My, my team had discovered a, a fluorescent turtle that is in the game. And we are now doing a large scale project on sperm whale communication, and that is in the game. Hello, Mariah. Thanks for checking in. Feeling settled in the sun? I'm great. Nice suit, nice sub. The single player narrative is set 20 years in the future and follows the adventures of lead character Dr. Mariah Soto, a deep water explorer and scientist, voiced by actress and YouTube star Anna Akana. I'm diving near a sea mount region, also known as the Twilight Zone, because it is just beyond reach of the sun. There was a, another scientist that worked with me was Mandy Joy, and she's a deep sea biologist from the University of Georgia and shared her expertise. There are certainly aspects of her personality that remind me of myself. I don't know how much it, she was based on me. She has a level of a, a tenacity about her that I recognize. I became an oceanographer not because I wanted to be an oceanographer since I was 10. I became an oceanographer because when I was pre-med and a junior in college, I took an oceanography course as an elective and the professor lit a fire in my spirit. Dr. Joy calls our expeditions cruises. They're anything but relaxing. When you're out on these research vessels, it's not the love boat. You know, I, I, th I tell people I'm going on a cruise and they think I'm going on the love boat having my ties at sunset. I mean, it is not. You are working anywhere from on a good day, 18 hours, and on a bad day, 24 hours. I think of myself as, you know, Aquanaut sounds a little corny, but I'm, a, I'm absolutely an ocean explorer and I absolutely love to go places where nobody's ever gone before. And I think there's a lot of parallels between, you know, the, the Star Trek adventurers and, and people who work in the deep ocean. You've got to have a little bit of that crazy, you know, explorer edge to you. We have a 12 year old gamer who normally plays Fortnite and she's excited about reviewing, trying out for us Beyond Blue. The game was really cool. I really liked all the animals that are in it, and you can see them like you're right next to them. It's great animation. There is a good amount of reading involved. Definitely people my age would like this game. Her name is Hayden. What would you like to say to Hayden? I think, Hayden, imagine yourself 15 years from now, and you're Mirai. What would you do different from what she does? What decisions would you make in the game, and why? Put yourself in her shoes. That's what I challenged my 12-year-old daughter to do. What's the one thing you hope they come away with from Beyond Blue? Passion for the ocean. Passion for the beauty, passion for the complexity, appreciation for what it takes to do what Mariah does. In this game, it shows a little bit of what, what it's like behind the life of a marine biologist. And I think they did a great job at Eli, and I think it's, it's probably one of the, the best games out there that really captures the experience of being a marine biologist, but you be the judge and get out there and give it a try. Game over. Whether we know it or not, we judge people based on some stereotype. Can science and data help us overcome those biases? Our Elisabeth Kovic spoke with virtual reality artist Clorama Dorvilius, who says, maybe. Clorama Dorvilius never expected to go into tech, but after experiencing racial bias, she was determined to help others through the science of virtual reality. I was very much driven 
into tech as a way to solve a problem. And once I found that technology had this potential to solve this problem, that's what made me want to sit in front of it eight hours, 12 hours, 24 hours a day. There was nothing that was going to stop me from solving this problem with tech. And I actually ended up loving it. After years of personal and academic success, Gerbilius encountered a professor with biases against her, which created an untenable classroom situation. Feeling like a second class student, um, being treated differently from my peers, not getting fair assessments or even assessed sometimes being ignored or neglected because I had a teacher a, a, an assistant who completely just underestimated my skill set, didn't have really much faith in me. At that point in grad school, I was like a full formed adult. So I had a sense of who, what I was capable of at that time. So I was able to recognize that what he was doing was not actually a reflection of my skill set, but was more so a reflection of his inability to see me as someone who is a capable and competent person in tech. Recognizing that for younger students, Classroom biases can be devastating. Dervilius built a VR program called Teacher's Lens. Teacher's Lens is a virtual reality training app. Welcome to Teacher's Lens, an implicit belief. You can put yourself into a simulation where you can measure your own unconscious biases in different scenarios. And from there, being able to review that data and play games that work. When teachers have high expectations of students, that's the strongest indicator for how well a student will do in the class. That's gonna be stronger than their social friends influence. It's gonna be stronger than their home life influence. It's gonna be stronger than their teacher's training and their expertise in the subject knowledge. It's literally how much faith that they have in the students to succeed, and which is, which is like crazy, right? In her own situation, Gervilius noted she had no data to bring to her university to prove bias. But her VR game, Teacher's Lens, like all VR, generates an enormous amount of data, recording hand gestures, eye movement. And this massive amount of data can be transformative in training teachers to overcome their deeply rooted unconscious biases in a new and unique way. I think the way currently bias training is conducted traditionally, it's, it's usually very much done to like drive emotions when people are getting a bias training, it's, it's they measure the success of how much a person feels, when that's not the actual reality of what drives change and what reduces bias behavior. And so what we did is we tried to reimagine what bias training could look like in more relation to the ways that we build empathy with others in the real world. And that's through positive experiences and positive conditioning and positive reinforcement uh, for inclusive types of behavior. The virtual world of Teacher's Lens allows people to work on changing their reactions by changing the muscle memory of their unconscious bias. For instance, if a teacher knew that he often looked right past the girls when it came to answering a math or science question, he might want to fix that behavior. And in a game-like environment, Teacher's Lens tracks improvements and rewards success. Too often, I'm always hearing, it's hard, bias training is hard, devising is hard, we can't do it. Like the, It's like, no, that's not, it's not hard. It's just, you have to be strategic. Like you have, you, the tools are here for us. And if there's a will, there's a way, right? Um, I, obviously being someone on the receiving end of it, I, my will is strong to try and solve this. Um, but it's a lot easier if you're, if you've never really experienced it personally or have a, a, to not have that much conviction, especially if you're in a position of power. Karma, you encountered bias in your own education and then brilliated your way out of the situation. So what are you, some of your tips for others trying to get through to the brilliant part? Of course, feel mad, feel like what you feel and, and know that you're valid in your feeling, but you have a choice. You can have like a woe is me attitude about it, but that really only hurts you. Like what somebody does to you is their karma, which how you react is yours. This has been Lisa Beth Kovitz for Simply Science. Some of the science in today's TV, movies, and video games may seem a bit far-fetched. What's the psi and where's the phi in science fiction? Here's our own Iron Man, Mike Gilliam. You can find it in a world gone to waste and ruin as depicted in many popular video games or in most movies from Marvel Studios, where ordinary men and women harness extraordinary superpower. But how accurate is the technology behind these fantastic flights of fancy? Refining the science of science fiction is the goal of this pair of PhD professors from Queens College slash CUNY. Marel Tajirian and Sebastian Alvarado share between them three children, 
a mutual love of science, and this book, The Science of Marvel. That was a, a book that specifically looks at all the science behind the uh, fiction of Marvel and the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Sebastian studies molecular ecology and neuroscience, while Morale, also a neuroscientist, cut her teeth role-playing on Fallout 3, a video game set in a devastated landscape. She was hooked from the start, but with reservations. For us, it started with video games. You know, um, if I pay $60 to uh, purchase a video game, I'm really insulted when, you know, they paid attention to everything except for the science. So I'm like, oh, come on, this makes no sense. Why couldn't they have fixed this? And that's how Thwack was born, in fact, because we wanted to, to fix that. That was a real problem. The pair founded Thwack Consulting, a multidisciplinary think tank in 2012 in order to deliver quality science that enhances both story and gameplay dynamics. Their unique insight makes those science fiction worlds more grounded in actual science. The Marvel X-Men team, that features like um, mutant genes forming the basis of incredible powers and all of that. Is that plausible? Humans being mutated and getting superpowers? Well, not very likely. Uh, could happen. Uh, mutations cause all kinds of things. Most of the time, bad things. Um, I think people really uh, like to spend their disbelief a little bit more when they think that there's some sort of uh, plausibility. So what makes Hawkeye such a good archer? See, the fun thing about Hawkeye and writing about him in the book is that there was no uh, fiction. It was just really all about, you know, hand-eye coordination, um, how our brains process visual information. Uh, that and also the Daredevil uh, parts, because again, Daredevil doesn't have special powers or anything like that, but uh, because he's blind, there are other ways in which his brain is kind of compensated. Laboratories always appear to be dark and mysterious looking in movies, but what are they like in the real world? That's actually been a really fun uh, aspect of the services that we provide with SWAC. Um, labs are the one thing that a lot of people have a general idea of what they look like, but have never really visited one. The best thing you can do is take somebody to a lab. We've done that with a lot of our clients, and they've always been super grateful. Now we do 360 tours, we take 360 cameras, we take them to different types of labs facilities, um, and that expands the, you know, what a scene can look like. The couple just wrapped up work on their next project. All I can tell you is it's a high-tech, big-time, top-secret video game. Keep an eye out for it. I'm Mike Gilliam for Simply Science. This year, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer A. Dudna were awarded the Nobel Prize for discovering CRISPR CAS9 gene editing tool. Why do scientists want to edit strands of DNA? We sent our Donna Hanover over to the New York Genome Center to find out. And no, CRISPR does not keep your lettuce fresh. CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Palindromic Repeats. It's a bit of a mouthful, but the easiest way to think about CRISPR is it's a technique that we can use to change DNA, to edit DNA. That's what it is at its very, very heart. And the reason that we might be interested in editing DNA is when we find, uh, through say sequencing studies, we find a mutation that we think has something to do with the disease, like autism, cancer, uh, diabetes. What we might want to do is really test to see, does this mutation cause this disease? And so the CRISPR tool is a wonderful way for us to very efficiently inactivate genes and test, if I inactivate gene A, does it cause cancer? If I inactivate uh, gene B, does it cause MS or Parkinson's? Lead investigator, Dr. Neville Sanjana at the New York Genome Center says, it's like a scissors to cut out and change small sections of genetic code in cells in the lab. How does it work? The CRISPR system commonly used is known as Cas9. It has an enzyme that's a short piece of DNA protein and an RNA molecule. The RNA component of the CRISPR system guides the protein component, the scissors, to a specific place in that three billion base pair genome and tells the protein where to make the cut. How do researchers physically accomplish this? It's a little bit of liquid that we deliver into the cell and either 
using an electroporator like that, we can shock the cells and make little holes in them to deliver it in. Or we can bind the DNA together with uh, lipids, fats, because the cell membranes are made of fats. And so if we bind it together with some fats, that tends to be drawn into the cell. And how do researchers know what the change in a cell means? You look at things like, how does the cell grow? Does it proliferate out of control? This is the kind of very clear phenotype that we associate with cancer, a tumor that can't stop growing. Once you've made the cut, how do you put in something new? After CRISPR makes its cut, there's a bunch of machinery in the cell that wants to repair any chromosomal break. So if we deliver a small repair template, the cell's natural repair machinery will actually use it to insert that piece of DNA, changing the DNA from its original form to the edited version that we want to put into the cells. A lot of what we've done in the pre-CRISPR era has been just observation. We look to see when we see an organism or a human being that has a particular disease, we maybe look at their genome, we read the DNA. But what's been lacking really has been the ability to write the DNA. What does the future hold? Gene editing is really just 50% of the task. The other 50% is finding ways to analyze the cells we create. We need to be able to analyze these cells and say, after we create the mutation, do the cells look like the kind of cells that are involved in diabetes or cardiovascular disease or in autism or in cancer? I think I'm just incredibly excited by uh, the confluence of biology and technology in this field, which I think is a fantastic thing to have the opportunity to work on things that can affect people's lives in such a positive way. So as genetic scientists improve and expand their use of CRISPR, hope is rising. In the fight against some of the most intractable diseases in human history, they have a tool that may finally help us win. I'm Donna Hanover for Simply Science. I think it's safe to say we're all experiencing some form of pandemic fatigue. But let me tell you, this is absolutely not the time to let your guard down, especially here in New York. Our Adam Miller got the facts from CUNY's Dr. Bruce Y. Lee. Masks, social distancing, hand washing, lockdowns. Will there be school or work tomorrow? The rising death toll and increase in COVID rates? The stress and constant worrying about the coronavirus is compounding into what experts like Dr. Bruce Y. Lee of CUNY School of Public Health call pandemic fatigue. So you're getting fatigue because you feel like you're trapped in this routine that will never end. You know, the pandemic essentially has it was declared in March. So now that we've reached the later fall and, and, and getting close to reaching the winter, and as the temperatures drop, as the air gets less humid, and then things move indoors, we're starting to see a surge in cases. And it's a difficult situation when you have people getting tired of dealing with the pandemic and taking precautions, and at the same time, the virus is surging. Can you give us a few pointers on, on how to beat the fatigue and how to continue to stay safe? Try to change up your daily routine, but don't change it up in a way that you're putting yourself and other people at risk. So that doesn't mean you know, start to ignore social distancing recommendations or don't wear your mask when you're supposed to wear your mask. But you can change up your routine in different ways. Like you can say, well, you know, maybe I'll go for a walk in different places, or let me try a different way of interacting with people. Two is stay healthy. So that means eat well, exercise. You know, all this this stuff always matters in general, but it's especially important now. If you feel healthy, you're less likely to get fatigued. The third thing you can do is talk to people. Uh, so you always hear this, this uh, phrase, we're in it together. And th that's true. We are in it together and we're in it together in different ways. We're in it together in the fact that we are all at risk for the virus uh, spreading and um, uh, catching the virus. But we're also in it together when it comes to uh, pandemic fatigue as well. Talk to other people. They can uh, give you ideas on how to cope with it. Maybe you can cope with it together or at the very least, you feel like you're being heard. Pandemic fatigue is something that doesn't just happen overnight. You know, you don't feel great one day and then suddenly the next day you're like, oh, uh, it builds up. So you wanna be in touch with your body and your mind and your emotions, etc. Also, Dr. Lee suggests we build a little bit of downtime into our day, whether it's setting a timer to remind yourself to get up and stretch, call a friend, read a book or play with the kids, whatever it takes to step back for a moment. And the last piece of advice is 
uh, have a low threshold for talking to a health professional or a mental health professional, et cetera, there's nothing wrong with it. We just have to remember that, you know, we're all human and that we all need help at some point. There are vaccines in development and some reporting high success rates in clinical trials. While this is good news, we should remain cautiously optimistic. It's a reminder that this is not forever. And it's a reminder that people are working on solutions and at some point things will get better. But there are caveats and the only thing that we know now is the here and now. So you only know what's happening right now. Right now we don't have a vaccine. So therefore be creative, find ways to deal with pandemic fatigue, change things up, all the things that I mentioned previously. So keep social distancing, wash your hands, wear masks, and remember, we're in it together. For Simply Science, I'm Adam Miller. And that's our show. Remember, you can always find us on the web at tv.cuny.edu and Facebook and Instagram. I'm Barry Mitchell. On behalf of the entire Simply Science team, stay safe, have a happy new year, and we'll see you next time in 2021. Come on, 2021!